Welcome to Between the Lines, a monthly podcast that explores books for a better world, brought to you by the Institute of Development Studies. In this month's episode, Kul Chandra Gultam discusses his book, Global Citizen from Gulmi. As a former Deputy Executive Director of UNICEF and Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, Kul has led a distinguished career as a diplomat and development professional. Here, he recounts his journey from a remote village in Nepal, lacking schools, roads and electricity, to the highest ranks. His story is a passionate jaunt spanning interesting times, places and people. Listen out for the bonus clip at the end for his words of encouragement and advice. Interviewing Cool is honorary IDS professor and former director, Sir Richard Jolly. Cool, you've had the most remarkable early life of anyone ever I've ever known. Growing up in Nepal, three days walk from Kathmandu. But you were discovered and sent to India for training as a monk. But that was only the beginning. Cool. Please continue the story, at least briefly. Well, uh, first, maybe a small correction. Three days' walk was from my village to the first school I went to. Actually, Kathmandu is much further away. Altogether to Kathmandu was nine days. But, you know, in those days in Nepal, my village was not considered a remote area because... Remote areas in Nepal in those days was defined as needing 14 days' walk. From your village, you first went as a monk to India? To be trained as, to a, be trained as, as, as a priest. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. And how long would, were you there before someone spotted you and you went back to the secondary school? I was in India for about two years. And then when I went back home to my village... At that time, things were changing in the world. I had a step-uncle who was visiting our uh, village, and he he told my father, this nephew, he used to call me nephew of mine, he's very smart. You're trying to make him a priest, a monk, a pandit? That's a waste of time. The world is changing. Do you know India has become independent? Democracy has come to Nepal. We had a first elected government in 1959, multi-party democracy, and the prime minister at that time was introducing a whole new education effort, introducing English, English meaning like in the colonial times, to produce clerks, mm. clerks, right? Mm. I said, this young man, you should send him and teach him English. Forget about Sanskrit language and, and, and Hindu philosophy and theology. And my father didn't know what to do. So he asked me, what do you think about what uh, this uncle of yours says? I said, well, you guys, you are the adults. You have to decide if this is good for me. Uh, I'm game. So my father agreed to send me to modern education, as it were, English education. But where? There were no schools near my village. That's why I had gone to India. So at that time, initially, he said, I will take him with me to Kathmandu. So I went to Kathmandu. That's when it took the nine days travel time. And I was in Kathmandu enrolled in a primary school. I knew Nepali. I knew Sanskrit. I did not know a word of English. None at all. And they had already started teaching in primary school English. So that was the hardest for me. But within a few months, I mastered English enough. So from a third grade, I got a double promotion to the fifth grade. But Kathmandu... Weather did not suit me. I was very sickly, uh, not feeling very well. It was too cold, the Kathmandu Valley. I was a mountain boy. So I then decided with my parents that the place that would be better for me is that school three days walk from my home. So that's where I went and enrolled myself. This was in 1962 Mm. in a school that was three days walk from my home. Is that the school where there was a Peace Corps teacher? Yes, indeed. And he spotted your talents. Tell us how you got the scholarship and then weren't allowed to take it up. Well, for the last year of my high school, the 10th grade, I moved to Kathmandu. And my Peace Corps teacher in Tansen had finished his Peace Corps assignment 
and was working for USAID in Kathmandu. So I contacted him and he remembered and he had always encouraged, oh, you are bright, you will, you will be able to get good education. So you're finishing high school, you should apply for a college in America. So what college, how do I do that? I had no idea. So there happened to be in that town, three days walk, another group of Peace Corps volunteers that had come afterwards, who one of them happened to be a Dartmouth graduate. And he said, this Peace Corps guy, my teacher, said, talk to him. He will tell you, you know, how you can get admission in, in various universities. So I go to him and he said, well, the only university I know is the place I went to Dartmouth. It's very difficult to get admission. But if you get admission, it is not so difficult to get scholarship. So I applied there, sent in all of my papers and the recommendations from the Peace Corps volunteers. And lo and behold, I got a full scholarship, admission with a full scholarship. Having been admitted to Dartmouth, which is an Ivy League college, getting a U.S. visa would have been no problem. But before you get a visa, you need to get a passport. So to get a passport, I went first to the foreign ministry. That's where the passports are issued. The foreign ministry people say, excuse me, you're going to study? If you're going to study, you need to get a permission from the Ministry of Education before you come to the foreign ministry. So I go to the Ministry of Education and the officer in charge says, how did you get this scholarship? You never informed us. You did not get a scholarship through the government. The normal process is a foreign university or foreign country give grant scholarships, a certain number of scholarships to His Majesty's government of Nepal. And His Majesty's government selects people from among qualified people. You didn't do any of this. You went straight ahead. There is no such provision. We cannot grant, uh, we cannot accept, recognize this scholarship. So then I had to appeal to a higher level. His boss denied. Secretary of Education denied. It goes to the minister. And it went all the way up to the cabinet. This guy has not applied for prior approval, not agreed to. This was a policy recommended by the cabinet and approved by the, His Majesty. Only His Majesty can change it. So they send my case to the palace. And the word comes from the palace after many, many months of waiting, do according to the rules, which meant I would not get a passport. So I was rejected to get a passport by the king. Normally, there is no higher authority than the king. When the king says no, it's finished. But I was kind of determined. I felt a deep injustice that, wow, I hadn't done anything wrong. I was qualified. So I, in this whole chain of people who looked at my application, there was one guy who was sympathetic, a joint secretary in the Ministry of Education, who had a similar background to mine, who had also come from the mountains, from an ordinary family, who had made it in Nepal. He had studied in India. And he said, look, young man, by denying you this scholarship, who benefits? Nobody. You don't benefit, but Nepal does not benefit. You should benefit. So he cited a rule. Apparently the king once had given a, a speech in which he had said, the policy of his majesty's government is to encourage bright students from the remote areas who are from poor background. That's the policy. You qualify according to that policy. But you don't qualify according to the procedures that requires prior approval. So he said, start all over again. Tell Dartmouth College that you have been denied. Can you reapply? So I reapplied a year later. And when I went to seek permission, the section officer in charge of scholarship again denied. Saying, How can we agree to give you a passport when the king has denied? Then I go to the, the joint secretary who was the man who said, according to the policy, he is seeking prior approval. He has not gotten a scholarship yet. And the policy allows him, and he granted me the, the uh, authority wow. to get the passport. It took what almost two years. <laughs> yeah, what a story. Yeah. You spent four years at Dartmouth. You then went to Woodrow Wilson School in Princeton, and you joined UNICEF. Where did you tell us? And you worked in Cambodia. Tell us briefly about that and how your career in UNICEF developed yeah when i was before i went to princeton when i was at dartmouth that was 
in the late 60s, early 70s, at the height of the Vietnam War. So the most important news, the headline news every day was what is happening in Vietnam. There was a strong anti-war movement, and I became quite involved in the anti-war movement. And in the course of the anti-war movement, I became so fascinated, Richard, with Vietnam. Who are these people, these Vietnamese, who could take on the world's mightiest superpower and in the end beat them? The first ever defeat well, of the U.S. they didn't know they were being beaten yet quite. In yeah, they were, they were at that mm. time, you know, that's a checkmate, as it, as yeah, it were. Yeah, checkmate but, and yeah. then U.S. paper, papers, newspapers yeah. suggesting that it yeah. was hard and difficult, but the U.S. was winning. Winning. So I had became so interested, I wanted to know about who could, who could bog down the Americans, the mightiest power in the world, a peasant country. So I became so interested... I want to learn more about Vietnam and the Vietnamese and, uh, and Ho Chi Minh and uh, the, the, the whole movement. So, and I, one day I wanted to go to Vietnam. I wanted to see these people who could take on the world's mightiest power. So I prepared myself. I took a number of courses on Indochina, politics and history. I knew Vietnam was a French colony. And at that time, their foreign language was not English. Now it is English. It was French. So I said, if I want to go to Vietnam, I better learn French. So I took French courses. So I was active. And then when I finished Dartmouth and I was at Princeton, 1973, February, Paris peace talks were going on. Henry Kissinger on the U.S. side and Le Doc Tho from the mm. Vietnamese side, they were the negotiators. And Le Doc Tho was a senior party man but not very highly educated, did not speak any French. So his deputy was a lady named Madame Gwen Thi Bin. I remember. She is an amazingly inspiring figure who took on Henry Kissinger and you know, <laughs> could debate with him. So I used to watch this news. And when the news came one day that finally the Paris Peace Agreement is being signed, the war is going to end. So I was following that news very excited, and I saw that immediately after that Paris Peace Agreement, Kurt Waldheim had become the Secretary General, succeeding Uthant in, in January. Secretary in General of the, of, the, UN. of the UN. He said, my predecessor, Uthant, tried so hard to bring peace to Vietnam, to end the war, and the UN failed. We did not succeed. But now that bilaterally they are coming to an agreement and the peace is going to come, the UN should start a massive post-conflict reconstruction and development. I was reading all of this in, in newspapers. And then I recall the very first person after Kurt Waldheim's appeal who responded was Harry Labouis, the head of UNICEF. The head of UNICEF said, you know, women and children are the ones who have suffered most in this war. We are going to launch a massive program all over Indochina, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, everywhere. Uh, and we'll start soon. When I read that, I was in the second year of my graduate school at, at Princeton. I had not finished my university yet. I said, aha, if UNICEF is starting a big program, maybe I will have a chance. I wanted to go to Vietnam anyway. So I sent an inquiry to New York to the UNICEF office, didn't know if they were going to respond, but I was called for an interview. Went to New York, had an interview with a guy named Martin Sandberg, who at that time was the chief of the Indochina Peninsula group that had been recently mm -hmm. set up. We had breakfast, we talked, and at the end of the in interview he says, young man, you are exactly the kind of person you are looking for. You have, you have done good universities, Princeton and, and, and Dartmouth, studied international relations and development economics, speak French, are interested in Indochina, and you are from a neutral and non-aligned country, Nepal. You have a perfect profile. We hire you. Wonder. Right on this one. I said, excuse me, where would you want to go, he said. And I, excuse me, I have still three more months to finish my university. <laughs> he said, don't worry. Take your time, finish your university, but where do you want to go? Because we're op starting operations everywhere. Vietnam, Hanoi, Vientiane, Phnom Penh, Saigon. And I said, my preferences are very simple. 
they go from north to south. Hanoi, Vientiane, Phnom Penh, Saigon, in that order. She, she, you get your first choice. You'll go to Hanoi. <laughs> <laughs> but in the end, Richard, I did not go to Hanoi. I ended up in Cambodia. And the reason was when UNICEF started the operation in Indochina, the Vietnamese said, you are, UNICEF is welcome to start operations and to help children in our country, but you should only deal with us, the North Vietnamese government, not with the South Vietnamese government, which they said was a puppet of the Americans. But UNICEF had this principle, you remember from Maurice Spade, that UNICEF will help children everywhere in need, regardless of politics. That yes, we will help North Vietnam, but we must also be allowed to help children in South Vietnam, which are under the control of the Saigon government. So that was a sticking point. They could not agree. So UNICEF, the Vietnamese thought that UNICEF was just bargaining, but for UNICEF it was a matter of principle. Deep principle. Deep principle. So uh, I was contacted by Martin Sandberg saying, sorry, we are not able to open an office in Hanoi right now. And your second preference was Vientiane, where we have just appointed a new rep, Fritz Lerison. And there is nobody in Cambodia. And uh, Cambodia was the most heavily bombarded at that time, before the final peace agreement came into being. Uh, would you like to go there? And I said, I was young, I was not married, I was adventurous. I said, why not? I will go to Cambodia, the most dangerous place where nobody wanted to go. So I went to Cambodia, Phnom Penh. I was the first resident UNICEF officer in Phnom Penh. We did not have an office then. And with one month of a UNICEF experience. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. So that's how it, I thought I would be in Cambodia and with UNICEF for a, maybe a one or two years and then I'd go back to Nepal. But I enjoyed the work so much. I mean, it was, it was very difficult. Cambodia and the, the heaviest bombing. Because the war, although the peace treaty was signed in February 1973, the war did not end until 1975. Yes. And the heaviest bombing was in Phnom Penh. People were being evacuated. So it was a very traumatic, in the, just, just before the Khmer Rouge came. Uh, and of course, when the Khmer Rouge came, we were all kicked out. Everybody was kicked out. No exception. Mm -hmm. UNICEF, you know, Russians, Chinese, everybody was, was, was kicked out. Uh, so, uh, so I never made it to Vietnam for UNICEF. But later on, of course, when I was regional director, I said, ah, I went to Vietnam many times. And many times, yeah, yeah. yes. You're listening to Between the Lines, brought to you by the Institute of Development Studies. Let me jump over the places you worked uh, as country rep or as a regional director in UNICEF. And then in the 1980s, you came to New York. You were brought to New York, particularly by Jim Grant, and played a major role in the run-up to the World Summit for Children. I think you have to tell us about that, because that was the first time that any World Summit had been held by the UN on any subject. And uh, But it wasn't just a meeting and show-and-tell and, and, tell and, and um, heads of state being photographed, Jim Grant had some very specific uh, objectives and he particularly asked you personally to make sure they were brought into the uh, agreement that emerged from the summit. Yes, indeed. Uh, before we come to 1989-90, when this summit was held, Jim Grant's leader, under Jim Grant's leadership, of course, Jim Grant had started this massive child survival revolution whereby millions of children were being immunized, whereas immunization rates had been very low, child mortality rates had been very high, and Jim Grant had figured that why are 40,000 children were dying every, every day? Every day. At that time. Why are so many children dying? It is not because they lack you no know, sophisticated hospitals or, uh, or highly trained doctors, uh, nothing like that. It was the simplest of things that cost very little. Immunization that could be had for a dollar or two dollars, uh, that did not require very sophisticated hospitals, uh, oral rehydration therapy, and he was able to show, UNICEF was able to show that you could actually reach a lot of children, save many lives, and if you could do that with a little bit of little organization mobilizing itself, 
how much more could be done if we had the world's leaders truly committed that you know you could have universal immunization you could drastically reduce mortality and morbidity and malnutrition and he was an ambitious man he said look i want we have now shown what is possible now let us mobilize the world leaders to really make a dramatic change in child survival and development so he called for a summit for children and many people kind of laughed mm. how can we have a summit for children leaders don't get together to talk about children when they leaders meet together they talk about more serious issues like war and peace trade and e- e- economy not about little children and their health that's not possible but jim grant was one of those people who said guess what if we got the world's leaders to talk about war and peace and economy and trade they would never agree with each other the only issue that they can agree on is children everybody can agree on and we are not asking for you know trillions, trillions. of dollars we are asking for something very sensible that every country can afford and actually he managed to persuade initially a couple of leaders who volunteered to be the people who would convene the summit six leaders in fact and uh, convince the secretary general of the un peres de coyar was the secretary general so the first summit for children was called and it became a grand success we had 71 heads of state and heads of government who came committed to child survival child rights child protection issues and uh, the first ever goals quantitative goals achievable goals ambitious goals were set in 1990 for the year 2000 and uh, you know in the un there were many other goals but, uh, you know, as, as you like to say richard you know, goals are ever set and never met in the un but jim grant was determined that we would set ambitious goals but doable goals practical goals that could be achieved without huge investment and indeed the summit for children was not only the largest summit i think it was the most successful summit in terms of its follow up afterwards so i had the good privilege to work with you and jim and others in setting and outlining what would be those goals and uh, those goals have turned out to be so important that later on they became the backbones of the millennium goals and you might say today's sustainable development goals the origin goes all the back to all the way back to those goals and you were very strategic after jim grant had died and other people had come in as as executive directors of unicef uh you were very strategic in monitoring the goals and then getting another world meeting which was going to be in 2001 well perhaps you could tell us about the dates and why why not if the goals were for 2000 why not have a meeting in 2000 yes indeed well um jim grant died in 1995 and there was some worry that the momentum that he had created under his leadership would slacken and indeed it slowed down a little bit when there was a change of guard but enough buy in by countries had been secured that even if unicef headquarters was not as committed as dynamic as 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 under jim grant and yourself richard the momentum continued so good progress was made so we wanted to organize a 10 year anniversary summit the second summit on children in the year 2000 and actually by that time i had finished my assignment as program director in new york was in bangkok as the regional director for asia pacific and carol bellamy called me back to organize this second summit and to set these ambitious goals and all preparations were ready everything was ready it was it was going to be held in september 2001 that's when 911 happened that was the last day of our final signing off of the declaration and plan of action and when 911 happened of course the whole world changed even the un general assembly had to be postponed many leaders could not come so that's why our summit 
the second summit for children was postponed to 2002, a year later, because of 9-11. But by that time, Millennium Summit had taken place in the year 2000. Mm. And as leaders of the world, that was, the, that was a much bigger than the Summit for Children. And its agenda was broader than just children. But when they were trying to identify what kind of goals should we have, Kofi Annan was the Secretary General. And they said, look, UNICEF has a good experience because they organized the first summit. There were many other summits in the 1990s. You remember the Earth Summit and the Copenhagen Summit and the Cairo Summit, all kinds of summits. But of all the summits, the one that was the most systematically monitored and significant results were achieved was the Summit for Children. So they said, let's go with the winners. Mm -hmm. These goals, reducing infant mortality, maternal mortality, illiteracy, the the child-related goals are the most doable and uh, and therefore those goals were, became really the backbones of the summit for children because Kofi Annan had been impressed with what Jim Grant and UNICEF had done. Yeah. So that is the background. Not many people know that the summit for children had so much influence on the MDGs, mm. but that is the fact. So let's part. Let's now move to Kul Gautam uh, as a UNICEF country rep or UNICEF regional director and uh, what you learned cool about how to get things done at country level. A lot of people think the UN and UNICEF too does things itself and in fact it's much more mobilizing action uh, in this case for children. But tell us uh, some of your experiences. Well I would say that uh, uh, UNICEF's working modality uh, is not uniform when there is a major emergency or humanitarian crisis. Indeed, in some countries that don't have good infrastructure, UNICEF itself might be heavily involved in implementation with its own staff and, and volunteers. But that is an exception. That's not the norm. In normal development setting, what UNICEF does is actually to train and empower your counterparts from the governments and sometimes from the NGO community who are everywhere so that they can deliver the services for their own children better, more effectively. And I think one of the reasons why UNICEF is much appreciated by many countries, even compared to other UN agencies, is the following. Most UN agencies are in the business of technical assistance. What they provide are experts and advisors. Some countries like that, some don't. Some need that, others don't. Sometimes many advisors are not very appropriate advisors, not very qualified or appropriate for that topic. UNICEF whereas has a combination. UNICEF provides some expertise where needed. But often UNICEF would call on UNESCO for education or WHO for health, but UNICEF itself would provide supplies and equipment. Many countries value and love supplies and equipment and training grants that most other agencies cannot provide. So UNICEF responds to the needs of the country. If they need expertise, we might provide expertise, but many of them say, particularly now middle-income countries, we have got our own expertise. What we need from UNICEF is things that we don't have. Can you facilitate in our training? Can you facilitate you know, capacity building, uh, supplies, equipment? Uh, so I think UNICEF tends to be very responsive to the needs of the country. And UNICEF was also unique in that UNICEF hired a lot of national professionals, national officers. UNICEF had more national professionals than any other organization. So the national professionals... They speak the local language, they know the, the government authority, they know the culture. So it was much easier for us to work at, at the country level. And I think the strength of UNICEF lied on this decentralization, using national authorities, national, national counterparts, and providing support that the government wanted, not saying, well, we only provide technical assistance. You have to go somewhere else to get, uh, get uh, finance or training or equipment or supply. So it, was, it came as a it's a nice package that yeah. countries must appreciate it. One of the uh, stories I like very much in your book 
you were the representative for a while in Haiti. Tell us what happened when you met Baby Doc. Yeah. Well, Jim Grant was one of those leaders who said, for the well-being of children, we'll work with anybody. Democrat, dictator, whatever, because our job is to help children. And that even dictators can be persuaded to do good things. And they were. You know, many, many authoritarian leaders we worked with, uh, Baby Dog Duvalier or, uh, you know, in, in, in Sudan and, uh, and elsewhere in Nigeria where there were, you know, Idi Amin and all kinds of nasty characters. Uh, I think they were persuaded to do good things. But there's a limit to how far you can go, obviously. I remember, I think, consulting with you at one point. One of the things that I was really scared but that Jim Grant was always looking for opportunities to mobilize whoever you could mobilize. In Haiti, the widest network was that of Tonton Makut. Mm. These, uh, these killers, you know, these uh, volunteers, as it were, they were serving the Duvalier regime. And in many communities, if you wanted to get anything done, you had to, you had to work with the Tonton Makuts. And um, while practically, you know, at the local level, people worked with them, we did not want to be identified with the Thonton Makut. But anyway, Jim Grant, he persuaded Baby Dog Duvalier. Baby Dog Duvalier was not a very smart person. Hmm. His wife was very smart, very clever, very cunning. And actually she was running her own hospital for children. And there was a lot of pressure for us to divert a lot of assistance to that hospital. And uh, I had the delicate task of being in good terms with the First Lady, but not channeling our support to her hospital, because that would have been utilized for their own political purposes. So there were all kinds of tricky things that we had to navigate. But um, we did it, and even in Haiti, Haiti was considered kind of the, the most hopeless case. Everybody had tried to help Haiti. The Canadians tried to help Haiti. They gave up. The French tried to help Haiti. They gave up. USAID tried to help. And that's why it's the poorest country that was closest to New York in the Western Hemisphere. UNICEF did not have an office there because it was considered as hopeless. So we had an office in Jamaica that ran for the Caribbean, including Haiti, whereas Haiti was the poor. It deserved the highest attention. None of the previous executive directors or regional directors thought if Canadians cannot do it, Americans cannot, what can UNICEF do? So they had given up. But Jim Grant was, no, no, you never give up. He said, we must be able to do something in Haiti. So he actually appointed me as the first representative in Haiti, brought me straight from, uh, from uh, Laos, and we identified carefully that, look, Haiti will not be a normal program. With this kind of dictator, which, you know, everybody was, was hopeless, but let's identify one or two things that we can do. So we identified oral rehydration therapy against diarrheal disease. That was the number one killer. And we did that one program in a massive way involving church groups, NGOs, and the government, but not only relying on the government because relying on the government alone would not have gotten us anywhere. But in the end, we made a pretty good impact. And when you met Duvalier, you had to shake hands because that was minimum yeah. the necessary protocol. But I seem to recall your book saying you chose the next opportunity to, to go wash to my the hands. toilet <laughs> and wash your hands. Yes, indeed, yeah. You said, and you said even more clearly in your book, when you were uh, at Dartmouth, you were very much on the left. Uh, in the UN world, we are very careful not to declare our, our political alliances, uh, particularly any that might be linked to our home country. But then when you have retired from uh, UNICEF, you did go back to Nepal. Tell us um, your experience there and where do you come out to it now? Are you a capitalist? Are you a socialist? Are you a... Um, a crypto something? <laughs> if I had to describe myself in one or two words, I would say I am now a principled pragmatist, certainly uh, very sympathetic to issues of social justice and equity, 
but not in a Marxist-Leninist uh, ideological from that perspective, because uh, while the idealism that is inherent in some of Marxist ideas, I think we can subscribe to the idealism, but in practice, what has happened all over the world is uh, a lot of um, oppression, a lot of uniformity, and ideology being used as a cover-up for many corrupt practices. Um, so I would hesitate to, my, uh, to consider myself in any ideological term as a capitalist or a socialist or whatnot. Uh, naturally, the, the, the sentiments are more towards socialist in the sense of seeking greater equity and greater justice but not in by following a Leninist or any script, but in a more pragmatic manner. Because ultimately what you find is that countries that have succeeded uh, to achieve great progress, rapid progress, say in East Asia, the, the Asian miracle, or, or elsewhere, uh, there are a few features that, that are common. Besides progressive policies, they have good governance. Uh, following the rule of law so that everybody has to follow the same rule, not that uh, some have one set of rules and another have another set of rules. Accountability and transparency in what you do, uh, those to me are more important principles than capitalism, socialism, uh, etc. So when it all boils down to uh, what am I, I would say, I think today I have become a, as I say, a principal pragmatist. Well, cool. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thanks for listening. If you like this, then please subscribe and share. Between the Lines is a monthly podcast published the first Wednesday of every month. It's brought to you by the Institute of Development and Studies. Follow us on Twitter at IDS underscore UK or visit ids.ac.uk. To the students of IDS, I would say, be persistent, don't give up. I think part of my, my own life's experience, even when the king rejected, I did not give up. So, so there, there is hope. And I would say, in terms of the UNICEF experience, uh, you recall, Richard, uh, in a book that you and I wrote together on Jim Grant, there were these ten commandments from Jim Grant. Mm. That if you are, I think, in, if you are in development you should try to follow some of those commandments. Now, what were those? That you have to set ambitious goals, visionary goals, but they make sure they are doable. Because you can have pie-in-the-sky kind of goals, many goals, but translate them into practical, implementable things. Then you try to mobilize. The normal systems sometimes don't produce the results. Be prepared to take risk. Be prepared to go to non-conventional partners. So in immunization programs, we did not rely on health officers only. When immunization were done in a big way in Colombia, you mobilize the police force, you mobilize the army, you mobilize the Catholic Church. So be prepared to do non-conventional things. Now reach out to, 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 to others. And then I would say monitor carefully because monitor and have a, a system whereby you check your progress, identify weaknesses, tackle the areas where you are not making, making, making progress. And then finally, I would say, no organization, IDS or anybody else can do it alone. We need partnership with others. So try to mobilize other partners uh, for your, your, your purposes. And, and I would say, among the partners you seek, Never forget the United Nations. UN is a reliable development partner because UN is one of those organizations that has no other self-interest. If UN is trying to help, it is trying to help because the cause is worthy of helping, not because it fits your ideology or politics or, or whatnot. So I think if you do that and mobilize, uh, be prepared to use Modern technology, nowadays there are technologies that did not exist at, at that time. Mm. 
mm-hmm. that uh, tremendous progress can be made. And I would say that uh, institutions like uh, IDS have already had huge influence in the many, many development planners in the world were trained here. And uh, many more can come and share their experiences. And I think uh, it's a tremendous opportunity for IDS students to, to change the world. Wow. 